Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snack Covenant, episode F42. I'd like everyone to close their eyes. Imagine you're in an enchanted forest. The leaves are falling into your hair. The wind is blowing on your face. And in the distance, you notice two magical creatures. Reveal yourselves, magical creatures. She means you. Hi. <laughs> Lace, Kaysarev, could you please introduce yourselves to anybody who's new to the podcast? Hey there, um, I'm Kaysarev, and I am a YouTuber and essayist, and I mostly basically research from software games, old, new, present, canceled at some points. <laughs> I write about them. I make videos about them. Find me at, at Casative. Hi, everybody. My name is Lise, and I guess I would say that I'm a YouTuber who has, like, way too much time on their hands and uh, who likes to, um, hyperfixate on like you know games that barely anybody else cares about <laughs> we were talking about rule of rose yesterday yeah <laughs> yeah it's a great game essentially what happens is you start off in the room you get told you're going to be a fairy and you have literally no context you're just being told this voice is this sort of vaguely patronizing voice is talking to you like <laughs> like you're a three-year-old getting you really hyped to be a fairy. And then you leave and you you have no idea who you are or really why you're there, but there's just stuff to do. And it turns out that, like, the kids have called on you. There's this little, like, note they were saying, oh, we hope there's a fairy here, and you meet Yulia. And then, um, basically, you spend a lot of time in this boarding school with these kids, helping them out with things. And then the two major things that sort of happen on the way is that you discover firstly that when Yulia contacted you, that was actually much, much further back in time than you realize. Right. Like, like, cause what it will do is it will give you the date, but it won't say the year. So when Correct. Yulia contacts you, you get a day. I don't remember the exact day because it's been three years. It's mostly in October and November. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go and you meet Yulia in, in October, November, whenever it is, then you go up later on and it's like, you think it's like the next day because it's like that date, but like plus one or plus two or something. And all the kids are like, oh, Yuli is called the fairy. We've got to do all these things for Yulia. Isn't Yuli a great? And right. then as it goes on, you realize, oh, wait, it's been a year. Yuli is dead. Yep. What happened was in between Yuli is summoning you and you coming back the second time, actually a year passed, not a day. But you didn't realize because it wasn't saying the year, it was just saying the date. So actually Yuli has been dead for a year. And you realize the reason that they're calling on you now isn't why Yulia was calling on you. They're calling on you now because they understand that fairies have the ability to manipulate time and they want you to resurrect Yulia. Right. <laughs> and then basically what happens is like it just it builds and builds and builds on that. Um, they're using you to try to like play with time to sort out like Yulia's problems, which leads to like you creating a bunch of divergent timelines that don't go anywhere. Um, you go back, you can because it's a, uh, an adventure game, you can essentially repeat chunks of it. If they don't work, you just go back in time and fix it. And um, this leads to the kids escaping from the um, the boarding school. And when they do that, oh no, they're outside of the safe space. Yep. And the fairy, you find out, oh, the fairy stuff that was happening in Rhone, it's out there too. And that fairy starts stalking them. Then it becomes much more of like a, the gameplay doesn't change, but it becomes more of like, okay, now you have to really start fixing things because now there's a hostile fairy on the loose and it's literally killing the children. Because yep. it's a, because of the way it's structured with the time travel, um, every time a kid dies, you can just go back and like try to fix it. So no one's ever really permanently dead, but they will die a lot for you on screen, often quite graphically. Also, like right in front of your face by like two yeah. inches, <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. If you want to watch your child desiccate and turn into like a skeleton in front of you, 
Go play Jurassic. Yeah, go play Jurassic. A lot of that. Yeah, yeah. And um, throughout that, what you then discover is that you trying to resurrect, like the kids trying to resurrect Yulia, is kind of like. This all happened before, but with the adults, they were trying to, like, the headmaster trying to resurrect Margarita, is it? Yep. But basically, like, you you discover that um, this is the part of it that, like, strikes me as the most, like, resonant with Bloodborne, which is, like, all these people are doing this absolutely horrific thing, but they're saying to themselves, well, it's okay because we're going to be in control of time when we sort it out. So once we finally crack this, we can just go back and stop the terrible things happening. So, like... As far as they're concerned, there is no cost that is too great for what they are doing. Mm-hmm. Right. There's, because, there's a lot yeah. of yeah. academic elitism going yeah. on. There. It's academic elitism and also the belief that, like, this is the ultimate, the ends justify the means situation because the ends are just being able to make none of it have happened. Mm-hmm. So it's like, we're just going to, people will be, people will die, people will be tortured, we will murder literal children. But at the end of it, once we get there, we can just go back and make none of that happen, so it doesn't count. And that's essentially the the approach that the um, the the sort of academics of Rhone had. And then, as this is going on, you're gradually piecing together more and more of like the history of these academics, like the schoolmaster of the the school that you're in. Like he's actually like a retired Rhone academic. The um, there's a corpse that washes up at a river. You discover that's possibly like the schoolmaster's wife. He might be Rose's mother, and um, eventually the question starts to formulate in your head: like, okay, well, fairies are born out of people. They're people that sort of like they go outside of time. They become these creatures. So who am I? Mm-hmm. And that's when it loops back around at the very end to that tutorial room, and you discover that. You all along were this Alexis. child called Alexis who disappeared, yeah. mm-hmm. and that's where you came from. So the tutorial room was actually your your birth as a fairy, and you realize who you were, and like you found like the there's a grave on the ground for Alexis, right? Like you hear about Alexis, and the thing about Alexis is that they had this very distinct scar along one hand, and then you, and you realize just turn because it over. you. You've had the power to control your hands all game. You're manipulating them with the PSVR. If you just turn the hand over, yep, you have right the there. same scar. Alexis, obviously, like Alexis is like a, literally like a baby when this happens. Yeah, I think they're not. They're not even like one. They look like no. They're they're an infant. Yeah. Yeah, they're an I infant. Bet. Yeah. So we're back to the the Miyazaki standard trope of like <laughs> what pushes someone to like okay the 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 founding act of this thing will be infanticide. And that taints everything. Everything that this place is is founded on this terrible, terrible atrocity. Mm-hmm. And exactly. it's sort of about realizing what that was. And he just seems to really like infanticide as that atrocity because it's like this sort of ultimate sin to him. Hey, it's uh, Hidetake Miyazaki here. As president of From Software and creator of uh, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and the other ones, I get a lot of questions. Uh, questions like, you know, where do you get your ideas? Berserk. Where's Bloodborne 2? Up my ass. But uh, the one I hear most of all is, hey, what's with the infanticide? This all stems from my relationship with a certain manga that was very influential on me, that manga, of course, being Akira Amino's Ketekyo Hitman Reborn. You obviously need a very high IQ to see the influence it had on me, which is why I appear on the Snack Covenant and no other channels. Back when I worked my equally thankless job at Oracle Systems, every week I'd eagerly await the new installment of Reborn, hoping that Suna and Haru would finally get together. And to this day, I still remember the rage I felt upon discovering that Suni in fact ended up with Kyoko. On that day, I declared war upon infant kind, and knew that my future lay in the games industry, creating the ultimate baby-killing simulation, which would later find form in the Valley of Defilement. Should probably have mentioned uh, earlier that Reborn is about babies. A lot of people don't know that because no one remembers it. Back to this. You don't know the whole time 
that you are Alexis and that you died as a child until you realize that you turn over your left hand and there's a scar and it matches the scar on the picture you see at the very end of the game. Like you don't understand that you are Alexis the whole time um, until like that last ending twist. The FromSoft swerve, as I like to call it. Uh, and then, yeah, the FromSoft <laughs> swerve, whiplash. The, this FromSoft whiplash. And, yeah, exactly. It's like, I didn't realize during my blind playthrough that Yurio was dead the whole time. Like, there's a lot of things that are surprising. The game starts with you become you being told that you were a fairy. doesn't tell you anything about that. It allows you to get used to that power and to roll around doing really fun, little, interesting, um, and enjoying your powers. It, 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 like, lulls you into a sense of, hey, this is a cool little lighthearted game. You're a fairy. Go play with this cat. And it lets you yeah. it lets you get used to these these powers and these abilities, and then it starts slapping you in the face, basically, with "Hey, Yuria has been dead the whole time." So when you say like powers and abilities, what kind of powers and abilities are they? Uh, you're able to jump back and forth through time. Mm -hmm. um, this goes back to how from software in the modern era has uh, characterized how time works or doesn't work. Um, it's slightly different in Elden Ring, but like Dark Souls, you are it, time. I, I like saying time doesn't matter. It's kind of more than that, but like in Dark Souls, time doesn't super matter. Um, and in Darasane, it kind of runs off of Echo Knight logic in that it is points in time, a constellation of stars. I mean, Elden Ring does the same thing about the star thing, but like Darasane each point in time is a literal star that you just jump back and forth through with your chronometer. Okay. And you change a little, you change one thing in time, it changes, it ripples across time. And then it changes everything. So it's like the butterfly effect with Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. <clears throat> pretty much. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Even, like even specifically, end, actually. <laughs> specifically you're existing in between points in time. Yeah. So, like, you'll see time move forward. You'll see people do things, and it will just stop. You are and outside of it. Yeah, you're outside of it. You exist specifically. If you imagine, like, you're turning the pages of a book, mm -hmm. you're yeah. kind of as the page is turning. It's like nothing has happened yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, it, it ties into this whole thing about like fairies and time, and like you're you're working sort of in between events happening, but people are seeing what you're doing. So, what will happen is you'll do something like you'll knock over a cup. And it might have taken you like five or ten minutes to figure out to do that. But from the perspective of everyone else, they were standing there and then a cup fell over. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Only very particular beings or people who've had things happen to them will be able to even like register that a fairy is there. Sort of like Rosa, who was injured earlier. And one of the big quests in, in Durasanae's, especially in the beginning, is trying to figure out a way to make Rosa not hurt anymore, mm -hmm. um, which causes a lot of issues, even though you are extremely well-meaning. Like, Alexis is never not well-meaning throughout the game. You said in the beginning they tell us we're a fairy, and then we kind of, I guess, wake up and we're actually in this Bergenworth-like school. What is the actual point of us being in that school? Like, what is that's cool for and what is actually happening there well i alluded to it earlier but you are alexis and alexis died as an infant to margareta and probably the headmaster i think yeah at least if you yeah possibly the headmaster being her father yes but basically the rest of the world has already gone through an apocalypse and the apocalypse came as a whisper the headmaster has been part of a group called the Rhone Scholars, who were messing and trying to figure out or harness the abilities of a fairy. Because if you can get a fairy on your side, then you can change time, and then you can make anything happen because you don't have to live with regret. But the thing is, you need to be around children to get fairies to show up. The reason for that is actually kind of um, horrifying. But the Rhone scholars figured out that they need to be around children. 
to harness the, the fairy's ability. They were successful, but the monkey's paw curls and the real reason of fairies, because fairies are not Coddington fairies. There is this very strong thread that the people of this world think of fairies like we thought of fairies, like Victorian Coddington fairies, beautiful feminine people with flowing hair and beautiful butterfly arms who float from uh, flower to flower who do mischievous things, but like Titania and Oberon, they generally, you know. Like Tinkerbell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, those cotton with fairies. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, Yulia's entire pin is basically a Coddington fairy. But the, the reality of the fairies in this world is a lot more horrifying than even the Roan scholars did, understood. And the reality of the fairies in this world are they are tall, lanky creatures. Probably seven, seven and a half feet tall, by my reckoning, maybe. Okay. They are bald. They have pointy ears. And they have basically, I want to say a visor because it, they're basically invoking the PSVR headset over yeah. their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where they can see things. And the thing is, fairies eat time. And time doesn't isn't created out of nowhere, sort of like the law of mass. Time is eaten from other people's time. Everyone has a lifetime. They have a time where they are born and then they die. Fairies eat that time and kill the person that they take it from. They're basically time vi vampires, but they eat they eat that time and kill the persons there. They rob a person of the time that they have to live. So if you take children, they have yep. supposedly the most a lot of time, time to yep. live. Yep. And that's why fairies hang around children. Mm -hmm. Not because they're mischievous Titania or Oberon Coddington fairies, like people who love children to like play and stuff like that. No, mm -hmm. because children have the most time because they have the most lifetime and they have the most to lose. Fairies eat that. So the academy was built and the children were put in there to attract fairies. So children are like bait? Sort of, kind of. Well, the thing is that they used them beforehand like that. And they destroyed Roan because the fairies got out of control. And so the fairies went out of control and they ate everybody in Roan. So it was like a fairy apocalypse. Yeah. yeah basically. <laughs> and yes, specifically, like the kids aren't in Roan. They're in a place that's, like, segregated from Roan. And, like, there's certain parts of it where you're trying to get out and you realize that, oh, they've, like, bricked this place up and they've, like, destroyed the tunnels and everything to stop anyone coming and going because they want it completely sealed off because of the fairies. Yeah, they're, they're being sealed off because they originally intended to use them as bait. It destroyed Roan, probably more than just Roan, because it is very apparent that there are very little bits of life in the world. And they brought them to this school and sealed them up to protect them. They figured out that cats are protective creatures against fairies. And so they have created basically a little bubble, and that is the school, to protect them because the headmaster and probably Margareta were regretful about what Pandora's box they opened in Roan. So then the actual academy, did they want to attract more fairies because they didn't learn their lesson? Or is it literally let's preserve these kids that are still alive? Preservation. Okay. Um, but, you know, they, they brought their books with them and the kids found the books too. So mm -hmm. like these kids are what, 12, 13? Oh, they're younger. Yeah. Yeah. And where do all these children actually come from? Where do they get these children? They're all, they're except orphans, for Rosa, they? they're orphans. Yeah. yeah. Except for, like, Rosa is related to the headmaster. Yeah. Alexis was their child, and the rest of them are orphans. Probably because the fairies ate their, their children, their parents. Yeah, probably ate their parents. <laughs> so the fairies are terrifying. The implications of it are terrifying. Yeah. But the game doesn't tell you this until you start figuring it out later so you are a fairy and that's what the game tells you but you don't know that you're actually pretty powerful and terrifying right it actually straight up hides it from you the mm -hmm. origin the the first tutorial level literally hides it from you 
So the tutorial zone actively hides what is happening. Um, the finale brings you back to the tutorial zone because it's a From Software game. And the final boss is in the first area. <laughs> um, and that's when it reveals everything that happened. In a way, um, I think that the guiding voice, like, you know, woman who, like, tells us that, oh, here you go, you're a fairy, you need a red ring. You're going to be a fairy! <laughs> And basically in that intonation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Aren't you excited? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Not knowing what I know now, no. Um, I think that the tutorial is basically her trying to hide it from us. The truth of everything, basically. She's, she's like, oh yeah, just like touch this like magic wand. Yeah, just do this thing. That's floating there. Yep, just floating. It's just pay no mind to the wizard behind the curtain. Mm. <laughs> there's like flo there's even like curling feather, like feathery fog, colorless and deep, flowing through the the halls of like, you know, the academy too. It's just like putting that section right next to the final section really reveals how much is occluded. Mm -hmm. And if you take too long in the tutorial she actually says something kind of like you know why are you like hesitating you're a fairy after all mm -hmm. so take mm -hmm. the wand in your hand and just yeah just do it just do the thing mm, yeah and so who is that voice at the end of the day i think lace had a lot more to say about like who that voice is right oh yeah um Juran I like I actually can't remember whether or not it's like before or like after we get uh, the red ring. Mm -hmm. I think it could be after where it's like teaching you how to use the controls and all that. There like um are these like pieces of um paper that are like pinned onto like a canvas. Uh the bottom of each page is a name that's been signed, which is Abigail. Mm -hmm. And I basically think that, like, you know, having the guiding voice and those, like, signed pieces of paper, it's basically the strongest connection that you can get as to who are the guiding voices. And her name is Abigail. And also, like, later on you find there's, like, a... Um, a photograph of like these five people. Yep. And you can pinpoint four of them as people you meet in game, and then the fifth one is a woman that you don't meet, but you can assume by process of elimination she's Abigail. Right. What I'm hearing is the point of this game is teaching children that uh, if you fuck around, you'll find out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sophie, do the outro. That was the Snack Oven in episode F42, Fairies Are Scary, with special guests Quesadive and Lace. Quesadive, Lace, if people want to find you on social media, where should they look for you? Um, I'm on YouTube at Quesadive. I am at medium at theomony.medium.com, and I am on Twitter doing Twitter things at Angel No Moon. And um, I am on um, YouTube doing like um, vocal synth covers. I am Astral Lace. And that's where you can find me because I don't think I want people finding my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. So, yeah, everybody, check them out. They have great content, they're awesome creators, and uh, we love them very much. Yay. Yay. Heartwarming, unlike fairies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sin. Thank you, Lace. Thank you, Sin. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Kesaru. Thank you, Sin. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And see y'all next time. Bye. 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 You can't see me because I don't have a camera, but I'm waving too. <laughs> <laughs>